Well, thank you everyone for coming this morning. My name is Chuck DeVore. I'm Vice President of National Initiatives for the Texas Public Policy Foundation, and I'm delighted to see all of you uh, here today. Uh, the topic that we're going to cover today is a topic that I think is extremely important on a number of different levels. Uh, it's important uh, that we look into the Environmental Protection Agency's Clean Power Plan not simply because of what it wants to do, which is vast and far-reaching, but because of how it represents or the method it represents of, of the, uh, how the, the, this federal administration is moving forward on a plan that has been uh, really in, in its current form rejected by the U.S. Congress. And so this is a way of kind of enacting uh, a legislative initiative uh, without the legislature, which is kind of a neat trick in our current uh, constitutional uh, republic. Uh, what you have with the Clean Power Plan is an effort by the uh, Environmental Protection Agency to label carbon dioxide a pollutant under the Clean uh, Air Act, uh, certainly something that was never countenanced back when the Clean Air Act was passed. And by so labeling it a pollutant, they're able to accomplish through regulatory proposal what they have tried and failed to do numerous times through legislation properly enacted by Congress. And so that's one big problem that perhaps will be explored today with some of our panelists. The other gigantic issue, of course, is that energy and the use of energy affects our lives in a very deep way, far more so than most of us uh, can appreciate as Americans. Because by and large here in central Texas or around the nation, uh, when we turn on the power uh, switch in the house, the lights go on. And rarely uh, do they not go on. Usually it's because of a storm or some other uh, natural um, issue, not because of the unreliability of the electrical network. Uh, and yet, because of that reliability, we take it for granted. And we f seem to forget the very elemental role that uh, clean and affordable and reliable energy plays in our lives. Well, the Clean Power Plan threatens to disrupt the very fabric of how Americans use energy and its costs. Uh, and that will be explored uh, a bit today by our panelists and hopefully uh, through some questions and answers afterwards with all of you. Uh, what I'd like to do then is introduce our, our very first speaker, uh, Representative Doc Anderson uh, has for over 20 years been an advocate of small business. Uh, he was elected to represent District 56, which is Waco and McLennan <laughs> County in 2004. Exotic he Waco, interesting. Pardon me? Like the exotic Waco. Exotic, exotic Waco, the, exactly. <laughs> I hadn't really thought of it that way before, but you know, if you really think hard about it, I think you, you could think of it as an exotic county. Yeah, yeah I think you're right. Um, <laughs> He, he's, he's represented that area since 2004 and has since been reelected four times. He was appointed by uh, former Governor Rick Perry to the Texas Small Business Advisory Council, and he currently serves as chairman of the Texas Legislative Rural Caucus, the vice chairman of the House Committee on Agriculture and Livestock, the House Committee on Investments and Financial Services, and the House Committee on Local and Consent Calendars. Now, brace yourself. Um, he is a graduate of... Texas A&M, School of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, <laughs> Representative Anderson has served as a small animal veterinarian in Waco, pardon me, exotic Waco, uh, since 1981. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join me in welcoming Representative Doc Anderson. Howdy, how are you all doing? Uh, it's an honor for me to be here today and uh, uh, with such great people in this great facility, uh, such a tremendous asset that we have uh, so close to the Capitol here. And I say exotic Waco, Texas, because there's so many positive things happening. You're well aware of McLean Stadium and Baylor and, uh, and uh, SpaceX is there and uh, MCC and TSDC. Everything is really, it's a great time to be in Central Texas. Uh, Chuck touched... Uh, uh, briefly on uh, some of the very, very important issues, the whole carbon rule, the whole idea that, uh, they, that carbon has been, uh, and CO2 has been determined to be a toxin, is uh, part of the very uh, problem that we're dealing with on this issue, but it's a much larger problem. And that's the administrative government versus representative government, where agencies start to write rules with the power of enforcement. 
uh, and uh, that causes a whole genre of problems down the road. Uh, I've kind of uh, created a new acronym, FBBC, that is the faceless bureaucrats behind the Beltway Curtain. And what happens when we have this type of administrative government, it's those faceless bureaucrats behind the Beltway Curtain pulling levers that we all have to respond to, no matter what the unique requirements of our state, particularly with power, but same thing with, uh, with uh, the ACA, Obamacare, no matter what the actual economics or the actual benefits uh, or lack thereof, we have to respond to what bureaucrats put in motion. Uh, and so that completely uh, subverts Congress or legislature here in, in Texas uh, and actually relegates Congress to a sideshow because they do what they want to do when they want to do it uh, and they have the power enforcement. And so that's a very serious issue. This particular one we're visiting on today, uh, where the EPA has uh, tried to force states to set up an implementation plan uh, to to uh, start to regulate carbon, and they have determined that carbon is a uh, is a uh, toxin, uh, which is questionable. The way they've done that is, um, and as I ask you, as we talk about these things, as the other speakers talk about these things, compare it to Obamacare. Just think about Obamacare because this is the template that's being used across the board. It isn't Obamacare if we just stayed up, set up state exchange programs, you'll be in good shape and then uh, if not, you'll be penalized and the feds will set up an exchange program. Same thing here. They're asking that we set up a state program and if you don't, well then there's a federal program that will be forced upon you. And that's how they start the carrot and the stick to get you going down that pathway. Problem is, once you start down that primrose path, it's very difficult to reverse course economically and once they start setting up some of these statutes and so that's where we're being hoodwinked and we actually have to stand up as a state, protect our state sovereignty, establish what we need, what our industry, what our science, what our economy determines is the best way to go about energy and energy uh, uh, regulation. <coughs> what they try to do quickly is there's four blocks that they have and they call this um, the best system of emissions um, reduction. One is where they actually control in the fence. You've heard the term in the fence, where EPA, and they have uh, some authority there, will control what goes on within the fence, that is on the actual grounds campus, if you would, of the, uh, of the electrical generating unit, primarily coal. The bottom line is they're trying to get rid of one-third of the coal fleet nationwide, uh, and uh, kind of like uh, Chuck had mentioned, you know, they, they don't have any uh, real concern about what the costs are. They haven't really visited about what the costs are, but they're trying to foist this uh, upon us. So the one is pollution within the controls of the power plant. And that's things like chemical cleaning of the boilers and, and um, preheated air exchange units, cleaning those properly, perhaps uh, equipment updates and uh, software updates. Those things are well within the parameter of, of the EPA. But that's where they veer off the rails. Block two is actually natural gas utilization. They're going to tell us what's the best way and how we are going to enhance and use more natural gas. Well, that should be determined not by the FBBC, the faceless bureaucrat behind the <laughs> beltway curtain. That needs to be determined by folks here on the ground looking at availability of these natural resources, looking at transmission, delivery, uh, and having price issues there and reliability issues there because as Chuck was saying too, we have come to depend on electricity as we see it as just a daily necessity. Well, some of these places where these type plans have been put in place, electricity has become a luxury, you know, affordable by those that have the money, but the, the very uh, lower ends of the economic structure can't afford electricity in a lot of ways. And so uh, that's where we'll be heading if we, if we embrace these. So one, they want to tell us uh, block two is natural gas utilization, block three is Increase the renewable energy usage. Well, hello, in Texas we do that. All of the above. Texas leads the nation in wind. We're coming up in solar. You know, we have uh, nuclear plants. We're doing that. And the way to do that is with the economic model, free enterprise, not by the FBBC. The free market hand is what uh, we need to do to develop these, uh, these uh, renewable energies. And third, and this is very uh, worrisome too, is uh, energy efficient targets. That's the end user reduction 
of the uh, use of electricity end users. Folks, that's you and me. And they have incentive plans at the front end. I say as an aside, show me the money. Because again, like with Obamacare, they had all kinds of incentives. If the states would adopt a state plan, well, there'd be incentives. Well, all those evaporate this year. So the 17 states that did that in Obamacare, every one of them is in the ditch. By the end of 2016, I'll guarantee you they'll all be going over to the federal plan. Same thing here. They're going to offer incentives to, so that you cut down your use of electricity. And it's interesting, ERCOT, which I very much respect, ERCOT's a great organization. They've done some uh, early <laughs> studies. ERCOT says that they're looking at, and they're projecting a 20% increase, which is very, very, very conservative. I would think it'd be more like 40, 50, 60% in that range, increase in your <coughs> electric prices, small business electric prices. <coughs> Big business electric prices. Uh, they say there's possibly 5%, 1% to 5% <coughs> efficiencies by regulating the in-demand use that you're using in your home with incentives. Well, the EPA says 10%, 9.9%. So you see the economy right there at the front end of the problem because <coughs> if ERCOT is closer, that's only 5% that they're going to be able to cut down the usage, and, and, and uh, EPA is saying it's 10%. Well, right there, you can see where there's going to be a, quite a problem with uh, cost, availability, and that type thing. And what do they do when the incentives don't work? You know, there's been some talk about constricting uh, electricity for air conditioning. Well, that'll work well in the People's Republic of Massachusetts, but that won't work well in exotic Waco, Texas. And so we really, and, it, and this affects the entire nation, so all the states have to be concerned about that. Uh, the, um, what these four things do, that's their plan for, uh, to uh, control the use of carbon, which, like I say, is questionable if it's even a uh, pollutant, really, but that's what they, they want to do. Uh, rather than having, like Texas does, we can decide what our energy mix is, and we should be able to decide what our energy mix is. The... Um, uh, but that's where we are, and it's, like I say, the administrative form of government where you, you get administrative uh, uh, groups want to decide what, what we do out here rather than the, the representative group. And these self-imposed regulatory constraints, New Mexico has already cut down one of their most, uh, shut down one of their most efficient uh, pulverized coal plants uh, to show good faith. You know, the idea is they want to be at the table and not on the menu. Well, they need to talk to insurance companies and other folks that dealt with Obamacare the same way. Let's kind of go along with them, see how things work. And it's a shifting paradigm. So you think if you approach this with a reasonable attitude and you want to try and work with the federal government and set up these things that have been long and hopefully helpful, well, it's a shifting paradigm. You know, with the uh, emissions reduction goals, there's a 2014 rule. And then there's a 2015 rule. Is there anybody in this room that doubts that there'll be a 2016 rule. And just like Obamacare, it's a shifting paradigm because they can write the rules as you rock along. And they will. Dodd-Frank is another example with the uh, banking industry. They're writing the rules literally as we speak. So we have to be cautious of that. It should be done in a much more regulated manner through the uh, representative government. We should protect state sovereignty. That's the number one goal is, is state sovereignty. The administrative form of government undermines state sovereignty. Uh, let me say here, I'm getting the hook here, the, um, think of the <coughs> average Texan. One, the Obamacare, increased premiums, outrageous deductibles, family of four, $13,000, uh, and what that does to our economy. Now, if you come in there and add 20, 30, 40, 50, 60%, whatever it is, increase in electric prices, where you'd be with that. So that average, uh, the folks on fixed income, seniors, or uh, youngsters starting a family, what would happen to them economically if this comes into full fruition. So with that, thank you. Appreciate you. Well, it was Representative Doc Anderson from Exotic, Waco, Texas. Uh, we're going to hear next uh, from Mark Walters. Uh, Mark is an attorney with Jackson Walker. His private practice emphasizes administrative and regulatory law and litigation from informal agency matters to contested case hearings 
uh, to trials and appeals in state and federal court. And I think that uh, one of the very fascinating things about Mark's background that's really germane to the Clean Power Plan uh, is that the Clean Power Plan has not yet been officially promulgated, right? It's just sitting out there. And the reason why it's just sitting out there uh, kind of goes to what Doc Anderson touched on and New Mexico when he talked about how you had this very efficient pulverized coal plant that was shut down in a good faith measure, uh, what, so that they could be uh, on the table as opposed to part of the menu or something like that, at the table as opposed to being part of the, uh, on the menu. So uh, what you're seeing with the clean power plant just kind of being put out there but not officially released is uh, kind of using the, the, the power of government in fear to get people into line, but it prevents uh, lawsuits. It's, it's a way of, of preventing uh, people like uh, Mark from getting engaged because there's nothing that's been official, right? It, it's, uh, oh, it's just, uh, it's out there for comment. We're just, uh, you know, here, here you go. Uh, Mark has also tried jury and bench trials to verdict, uh, as well as appeals in both state and federal courts and has handled litigation matters in 27 states. I'm sure none as great as Texas though, right? I mean, not. In Texas not and, the, and 26 other places, some of which aren't even as large as some of our counties. Uh, Mark recently served uh, for several years as an assistant attorney general for the Texas Attorney General's office in the Environmental Protection Division. He has handled contested matters with the EPA, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Natural Marine Fisheries, and other federal agencies in federal and district courts. Prior to entering private practice, Mr. Walters was a law clerk for the United States District Court uh, for the Southern District of Texas. Now, Mark, I don't know whether you have um, uh, already arranged to have a really cool acronym, and I don't want to put any pressure on you, but as a uh, lieutenant colonel in the Army and the retired reserve, I, I have a high um, love of acronyms. Um, and Doc Anderson gave us uh, FB3C, for uh, faceless bureaucrats behind the Beltway curtain, and so if you can top FB3C, then uh, then you know I'm looking forward to to uh, to that. So uh, no pressure though, but Doc Anderson unleashed a pretty good acronym. So, Mark. Thank you very much. Um, I, I have a PowerPoint, uh, which is a. It is a, a much reduced uh, version of a PowerPoint that we prepared uh, that illustrates the differences between the proposed rule and the final rule. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about those differences today, um, but, but we do have copies of our larger PowerPoint available on the information table. Feel free to take those. Uh, use them uh, in any way and for any purpose uh, that is helpful. Um, unfortunately, and I will tell you by way of background, although I am a lawyer, I'm not a career environmental uh, lawyer. I've spent most of my career uh, litigating uh, either for or against heavily regulated uh, industries, but I did not really become involved with environmental law until I went to work for the Attorney General's office uh, about six years ago. While I was there, I was fortunate enough to be involved in, in some capacity in almost all of the federal rule challenges that Texas was involved with against the EPA and against other federal agencies. But I will tell you, when I was first sitting in conferences and on telephone conferences about the Clean Air Act, I had no idea what anybody was talking about. And I had prided myself on my ability to be a quick study and deal with very complicated, very technical issues like securities litigation in federal jurisdiction. And I came out of the first few meetings literally thinking, I know these people are speaking English. I understand many of the individual words that were used, <laughs> but I'm not sure I understood even one of the sentences that came out of anybody's mouth. Um, I, I was. It made me feel somewhat better to find out that that is not uh, an unusual experience that people have on first encountering the Federal Clean Air Act. Unfortunately, it makes it very, very difficult for a gathering like this um, because we could literally talk for weeks uh, about 
this rule and the problems with this rule uh, and not get to the end of it and still have more things left to cover. Uh, so what I've tried to do, and I, I really am the world's worst with technology, but I hope this works. Um, hmm. All right, they said I could point it at the door and that might make it work. Okay, that's not working either. I was afraid of that. Oh, there we go, okay. I really am, I, I, I told them before I came, imagine you want your cat to run this PowerPoint, <laughs> shoot it at that level and we'll be somewhere, somewhere in the ballpark. But the, the clean power plan is promulgated under section 111D as in dog of the Clean Air Act. You may, and you may hear that thrown around a lot, the 111D rule or the 111D plan. Section 111 was originally intended to be a technology forcing provision for new sources of air pollution, new power plants and new refineries and to establish the, the uh, most cutting edge pollution reducing technology for these new sources under Rule 111 B as in boy. Um, the, the D rule was then to allow the EPA, after it had promulgated these uh, rules for new sources, to make suggestions to states for how to lower emissions at existing sources. What, what the Clean Power Plan does is it turns that inside out. Um, in exactly the same way as, as taking the sleeve of a shirt or a jacket and turning it inside out and focusing on the D standard. And it sets a D standard, and, and this is on the left, clean power plan, this is the standards for coal plants that are set forth in the rule. It establishes a standard for existing coal plants at 1305 pounds per megawatt hour. Um, but the, the standard for new, for brand new coal plants is 1,800 pounds, uh, excuse me, 1,400 pounds per megawatt hour. And for existing plants that, that meet a, a, a standard I won't go into the technical details of, but that are called modified uh, existing plants, that standard is 1,800 uh, 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 pounds per megawatt hour of, of CO2. So EPA is basically admitting that there is no existing coal plant that can meet the standard that, ex that it has set for existing coal plants to meet. And we've been struggling to come up with a, a really good analogy for how to explain that. And the best one that we've come up with so far is, is the automotive analogy uh, that we've set forth on the right. Um, it, it, is, it is somewhat similar to, to saying that EPA comes up with a, a miles per gallon standard for your car uh, at 60 miles per gallon while acknowledging that there's no way to uh, uh, create or retrofit an existing car uh, above 40 miles per gallon. But it nevertheless says that your existing car must meet a standard of 70 miles per gallon that's higher than the standard for new vehicles. And the way that they get there is that they assume that given this new standard, you'll either buy an electric car that has no emissions or, or take the bus or work from home or do something else so that over the year, your average comes out to be not even 70, but 80 miles per gallon. And to top it off, you can't get any credit for the Prius that you bought in 2011 or anything else that happened before 2012. So this, is a, this slide shows where Texas rates in terms of CO2 emissions in pounds per megawatt hour. And, and the takeaway from this is just that uh, although Texas is one of the greatest energy consuming states because we have the greatest manufacturing base, um, in terms of our CO2 emissions, we're nevertheless below the national average. Uh, but as you can see from this slide and the next slide, Texas is here on the end. The takeaway from these two slides is that the amount of CO2 reduction being placed on Texas is far, far greater 
uh, than any other state. So basically, they're asking us to keep being the leader in manufacturing, to keep being the leader in all the highly intensive energy activities that we're doing as long as we stop using the energy. This, uh, this slide talks a little bit about the renewable energy section component of the plan. And the takeaway from this is that what's happened and I'm not, this is not going to be, it's not an acronym, and I'm sure it's not going to be as anything good as Representative Anderson com, came up with, but my colleague Mike Nassi coined the phrase Frankenfleet for, for the, the electricity fleet that EPA wants us to have. And, and what we mean by that is that in looking at the different types of renewable energy, uh, what EPA has done um, is they've taken the highest growth year since 2010 of each type of renewables, and then they have assumed that that growth rate will continue each and every year until 2030. Um, and I am, I'm going to skip over a couple of these because I'm running out of time, but I, I wanted to show you this, the, the real problem with that assumption is that if you look at this little box in the middle, in 2012 there was a concern that the wind energy tax credit would go away. So af after 2012, so in, in 2012 there was a huge increase in the amount of wind energy that was produced and it dropped off substantially in 2013 because we essentially did two years worth of wind growth in 2012 but EPA's rule doesn't take any of that into account. They simply assume that wind technology uh, will continue to increase at this 2012 rate until we get to 2030. And what that ends up with, as you, I'm just gonna quickly go through these slides, but what we in Texas will end up with if we take these EPA assumptions is on peak days in August, when it's 105 degrees outside and the wind isn't blowing on the high plains where all the onshore wind is, we're going to end up with a gap in electricity. Uh, and this slide shows what that gap is when the, when the demand is at its highest, our wind fleet is working the least. And that might not be a problem if EPA had the authority from Congress to tell other sources to operate them, but they don't. They're just hoping that gas or somebody else will step in and fill the gap. And I, I'm sorry I'm out of time, but I will just leave you with this, this slide. This is, is breaking down into terms that we can all understand uh, what the assumptions are of the renewable portion of, of EPA's clean power plan. Um, and what this shows, this, this second from the left blue bar that says world, that is the current renewable capacity of the entire world today. And the blue under China is China's current renewable capacity today. The bar, green bar next to that that says CC CPP ERCOT is the assumption that Texas alone will add to its fleet as much wind and solar as China currently has today and that the United States will add to its fleet more wind and renewable than the entire world has existing today and that that's going to happen by 2030. And so we don't have time to go into it now, but I, I, I think that if, if that suggests that somehow electric bills will go down if we adopt this plan, I, I'll try to work on a good acronym for that. <laughs> Thank you. I think there's an existing acronym uh, that you could use uh, that would assume the unassumable, right? But we won't, it's, we won't go use it because of polite company here. Um, although Frankenfleet, it wasn't yours, but that, that was pretty good. So I, I'd say Frankenfleet, that, that, we'll, we'll let that qualify. 
you had mentioned in that last slide I I the enormous amount of renewable that the EPA plan assumes uh, versus uh, what the entire world has today. And I think it's uh, important to, to note that under the EPA's own calculations, if this were to be enacted and completely followed through on, assuming that you could pay all that extra money for your electricity, the EPA's own calculations assume then that the uh, net uh, reduction in the uh, global temperature would be 0 0.02 degrees Celsius. Um, that's a lot of pain for no gain, isn't it? Well, anyway, next we're going to hear from Peggy Venable. Peggy is the Senior Policy Fellow for Texas Policy and the Legislative Director for Americans for Prosperity, a grassroots organization committed to educating and mobilizing citizens about economic policy and the public policy process. Peggy is a native Texan. She's worked in public policy and grassroots campaigns in the political arena and the private sector uh, for over 35 years. She's served as a senior staff at the Republican National Committee and was director of the Republican National Convention in 1984. And think about the 1984 campaign. It was morning in America. It was the, uh, the re-election mm -hmm. campaign for a certain uh, Ronald Reagan, and you got to be the director of the uh, National Convention that year. Wow. Peggy was the first uh, White House liaison for the U.S. Department of Education for President Reagan. She later served as White House liaison in, uh, for the U.S. Uh, Department of Interior. Was that when uh, James Watt was there, or was it Hagel? Uh, uh, Hodell. Hodell, right. She has won numerous uh, public affairs and journalism awards. Her opinion pieces have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Fox News, the Houston Chronicle, Dallas Morning News, and more. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Peggy Venable. Thank you so much, Chuck. Every time I'm introduced, it just reminds me how old I am. You don't do the math, please. I was just a child in the Reagan administration. First, I want to say thank you. Thank you to those of you who came today. Appreciate so much your being here. I want to thank TPPF for partnering with us on this. We're very excited to be doing that and honored to be part of this illustrious panel. So uh, let me just first share with you a little bit about Americans for Prosperity. We are 2.3 million activists. We are in 37 states. And you here today, I believe this is the launch of our Switch Off Washington tour that will be traveling the country. So um, thanks for being here for our first, first stop. We'll be in Arizona and Colorado next, I believe. Is that right, Jerome? And um, of course, this is really an issue important to us because we recognize full well that our mission is to promote free market policies. And we recognize that free market um, policies like a, a really give us affordable and reliable energy, which is really needed to grow our economy. So thank you, Mark, for being the first one to test out this little gadget here. We'll see if I'm as smart as a cat, a <laughs> dumb cat, we'll see. But um, I do have a little PowerPoint, and I don't know how many of you picked up a little flyer, but we do have a flyer. We hope you'll pick this up on the way out. I'm really just going to go over what Talking Points Americans for Prosperity is using as we travel the country talking about this <laughs> issue. And the fact is that this rule is really what we like to say it's unprecedented, unconstitutional, uh, and really un-American. It is the most far-reaching regulation that has been promulgated probably even by this administration. We believe the EPA doesn't have the authority to be doing this under the Clean Air Act. And the fact that Congress rejected this plan and yet the administration moved forward to enact it is really, we think, very un-American. So we really want to talk also about how this will implement our economy, but also Texas families and individuals. Um, first, we, we uh, think it really is a so-called clean power plan because it will require Texans to reduce emissions by 33% by 2030. And we feel like that's really something that is uh, it's a challenge, most assuredly. And what will it do to us? Um, at best, it's a really the unintended consequences of this, what we, let's get, be charitable and say it's well-intentioned regulation. And uh, the, the fact is that it won't really impact the environment appreciably. 
And uh, so we really want to kind of go over a little bit of that and then really talk about how it really threatens our ability to provide reliable and affordable energy in Texas, something that our families and our state relies on. You know, we've been so proud that Texas has been the job creation machine for the country. And we've done so um, truly thanks to reliable and affordable energy. And we believe this will grossly threaten our ability to continue to create jobs. And the fact is the U.S. really would not have created jobs in the last, uh, in, in this administration if it hadn't been for Texas. With a threatened over 41,000 coal-related jobs and 7,800 manufacturing jobs at risk because of these higher energy prices, really impacts every family in Texas, not just those that are, that are dependent on those jobs, but extended families and, and uh, those in the communities around them. You know, the higher energy costs, too, will be passed on to Texas consumers. And uh, it, there are, you know, different estimates of what it will cost, 10% more uh, uh, during peak time, 17% more. Let's think about this, not just for the family on a fixed income or the elderly on fixed income or middle or low income families, but also let's look at the energy prices for our schools and, uh, and other public and private entities. I think it's going to really be devastating if it's allowed to go into effect. So we're really asking the question, can Texans really afford this over $1,000 more for energy? And uh, I think uh, Jerome Greener, uh, our state director, sitting right here in the audience, penned an op-ed in the Houston Chronicle that I think really put it well. He pointed out that even if it's not painfully unaffordable at first, the cumulative effect of this will be even more painful with every passing year were this to be allowed to be enacted. We also want to talk about the fact that, um, as someone pointed out to me yesterday, that we, we often say, well, this will hurt the poor the most. And yes, it will. But we are being promised subsidies and assistance for the poor. We have all those built into place. Though I think we all know, and I heard a very amazing statistic, that many inner city kids in Texas end up moving schools mid-year or during the school year for one reason. They moved because their electricity was turned off in the home they've been living in. Is that amazing? So I think even the poor are grossly impacted by today's energy crisis, let alone these additional ones. But I think that we also need to point out the fact that everything we purchase, in some way, there's an electricity or energy cost built into that. You go to the grocery store, every uh, clothing store, wherever we go, everything we purchase will likely cost us more by virtue of this. So it's not just as we write those checks to the, to the electric utility company. And I think that, uh, Mark, you did a great job with those visuals. Thank you. I, I love that presentation really giving us the picture of just what Texas is being asked to do. We are being asked to tear, carry a very disproportionate share of these regulations. You know, here we produce 11% of the total um, U.S. electricity production, but the EPA is demanding us to carry even more. And I think it's amazing, I, uh, I think Mark pointed this out, that yes, Texas has more wind power than any other state in the, in the union, but we also have more wind power than all but five other countries in the world. So Texas really has been doing the lion's share and doing very well with our environment. And yet Texas really has lower emissions than 32 other states. And yet, uh, I, I'm looking at this, the new rule will force Texas to reduce CO2 emissions by 2030, more than 27 other states combined. That is shocking, isn't it? You know, and what for? And I do not have a good analogy. I'm sorry, I don't have any alphabet soup that I will refer to, but I'm gonna call this rule the three-sheet rule. 11D is the three-sheet rule. Uh, you know, let's just not mince words, that this plan is really, <laughs> it's a dud. It is all pain and no gain to the environment. Now, if we should cut our emissions by 33%, and we claim that it's in the name of a cleaner environment, but that's really not what we're going to be getting. Even according to EPA's models, the regulation will only result in a tiny 0.012 degree 
decrease in world temperatures. You know, Texas doesn't have our own, own temperatures. We think we do because it's hot here. But it's the world temperatures. And what does that really equate to? When, when if, if, uh, if any of our kids have seen the Al Gore movie, you know, it's uh, uh, the rising uh, 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 ocean tide, it would equate to, the claims are, three sheets of paper, three sheets of paper in terms of the tide, uh, the ocean level. And with the tide, it, it means nothing. It means nothing. So I think that it's all pain and no gain. It truly is a dud. I think it's important to point out, too, this isn't a partisan issue, that, and, and it should not be seen as one. Environmentalists can't really tout that this is helping the environment. What is it doing? It's causing us to pay more for electricity, and that's going to impact every single family, every business. But I, I have to say, as usual, thank you, we are so proud to be Texans because Texans are pushing back. Our state leaders are willing to stand up for us and to push back against Washington. And I looked it up. I thought I remembered the number, but General Abbott, when Attorney General, sued the federal government 25 times. Thank you, Governor Abbott. And our Attorney General has gone on record as saying what his plans are. And I'll share with you, it's actually on his website. I think it was a speech that he actually gave at a TPPF <coughs> luncheon where he talked about his plans. But he pointed out the fact that that this administration is trying to do through regulation what they could not do through Congress and legislatively, what it would do to us. And he said, that's why we fight, and that's why we'll continue to fight back against EPA's carbon rule. We'll have to say thank you to Ken Paxton, uh, I mean to, uh, to our Attorney General. And so I guess the final, final, finally, we'll just talk about what can you do. What we have done is, is thanks to Lauren, we've put on our website, our drum has listed something that you can sign on to to say thank you to our Attorney General and to so show support for what Texas leaders are doing. We hope you will go to our website. Our website is aftx.org. It's also on our materials. And sign up. Make sure that our Texas leaders know how much we appreciate that they are willing to fight and to push back against Washington on our, ben on our behalf. Thanks so much. Thank you, uh, Peggy. I was going to actually go back and, and point out on that uh, previous slide, I don't know whether this thing will, will work or whether we've already gone back, oh, they've already switched it over. Um, Peggy actually has an acronym. Look at this, Switch Off Frankenfleet. Oh. See? <laughs> See? You're, you're better off than you realized. I, I think you're already there. So Peggy was talking about um, jobs at, at one point in her presentation uh, and talking about the thousands of manufacturing jobs uh, and other jobs that Texas uh, stood to lose. Uh, one of the things I found fascinating was uh, until a few years ago, the administration through the Bureau of Labor Statistics was counting green jobs. And then because of the sequester, they stopped counting green jobs, so they say. Uh, it's important to note that among the green jobs that they counted, were jobs at landfills, right? Because if you're sorting garbage, that's a green job under their definition. Of course, that actually happened to be one of the larger numbers of jobs were uh, jobs at landfills. Now, one of the reasons why they stopped counting it, I think, was that the number of jobs being added was actually quite small. Uh, in California, where they were making a very big deal about the increase in green jobs, they talk about the percentage, but they never mentioned that it would take over 30 years of green job growth for California to even begin to make up some of the jobs that they lost a few years ago because we're talking about such a small number of jobs. And so I was very interested in hearing the thousands of jobs that you cited that Texas stood to lose under the Clean Power Plan. Our next uh, speaker is Kathleen Hartnett White. Kathleen is the Distinguished Senior Fellow in Residence and Director of the Armstrong Center for Energy and the Environment here at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Kathleen, I know personally, works tirelessly to stop federal government overreach. Uh, in fact, I guess that's what you'd call job security. <laughs> Kathleen Hartnett-White was appointed to the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality by Governor Perry and served under Governor Bush on the Texas Water Development Board. She is the, uh, on the editorial board of the Journal of Regulatory Science uh, and the Texas Emission Reduction Advisory Board and also serves uh, with the Texas Water Foundation. Her articles have appeared in numerous publications, including National Review, Investors Business Daily, 
The Washington Examiner, Forbes, Daily Caller, The Hill, and other major newspapers across Texas. Now this is the really exciting part. She is, no, it's not about an acronym, I wish it was, but, but she's currently nearing completion of her book, co-authored with Steve Moore, uh, who I think is now the chief economist over at the Heritage Foundation, formerly of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the book is entitled Fueling Freedom, How Abundant Energy Has Transformed the Human Condition and Released Billions from Poverty. So we're all very much looking forward to the release of that book that Kathleen has been laboring on so diligently over the last several months. Ladies and gentlemen, Kathleen Hartnett White. Well, there's a lot of advantages for being the last speaker. You can write your speech. You have some, enough time to get it outlined. Um, but, but, um, and then most of the others have, have shared uh, more articulately what, what I might. But I do, I, I might stick with the acronym theme. Um, you know, EPA names this rule very benignly. Who could be, you know, the clean power plan? Who could be? But I would like to call it the cruel power plan because it really will hurt everyone, and most particularly um, um, middle and low income people. Um, and I'll, I'll give you uh, kind of examples. This is an odd, I'm gonna speak after s some specific things about the plan in really more general terms. This is a very odd time, I, I would say in human history. Um, there's never been a society that wanted to reduce the amount of energy that, had accessible, it had, uh, that was accessible to it. You know, we live, we consume so much energy. Our iPhones begin with, with um, electricity. I like to say the, I, the iCloud begins with coal because they need, not only do they need constant energy um, throughout all the phases of what people now call the global digital ecosystem, but it's got to be reliable, particularly for, the, for the, the data centers on which all of what we do with digital energy. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's transforming an electron into a photon. So it's, it's a high, high, high energy consumption of what looks like the, the cleanest, um, smallest device you, um, you could imagine. It's not about pollution. I'm reminded of that particularly because in um, Pope Francis's um, speech at the White House um, this morning, speaking about climate change and why he thought there was an urgent need to address it, <coughs> that he kept talking about pollution. Pollution is a very important um, um, human issue, but guess what? We have now, you never hear about it, we have um, in this country and in almost all wealthy, prosperous countries which enshrine freedom, um, real pollutants that could impact human health have been reduced drastically. And it was, it was the, the um, actually the private sector more than any other that developed all kinds of creative emission control devices. You can, won't go to, now you can go to EPA's website, they don't talk about the numbers, but um, um, the, the amount of reduction in real pollutants that can harm health is, is just phenomenal. Um, but so this rule and the whole climate change thing is about energy, not about um, pollution. I think that's very, very important. You know what most, how most dictionaries def uh, define carbon? Carbon, anybody have a handy? Um, the, usually the first um, definition is the chemical basis of all life. Um, to have our national leaders refer to carbon, carbon dioxide as among, this would be a quote of the Secretary of State's, among the most worst weapons of mass destruction is dizzying, dizzying. Um, not only we, when we think of, of energy and fossil fuels, we think of electricity or we think of, of transportation fuels. The entire global food supply is dependent on major um, fossil fuel input. Fertilizer based on carbon dioxide has enabled productivity that would have been undreamed of, um, that has, has um, changed the whole dynamics on, 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 on poverty and um, an adequate food supply. Um, the United Nations says that, and <coughs> the United Nations has recently said that more people were released from prop poverty in the last 50 years than in the last 500 years. And that has all to do with energy. It runs through our society like the metabolism of the, of the, of the, of the human body. And, and now we supposedly have an urgent threat um, to the planet from uh, um, CO2 emissions, and yet 
there are hundreds and hundreds of studies that also show that the amount, slightly amount, increased um, CO2 in the atmosphere as a result of human activities is, is it's working like a fertilizer there in terms of plant productivity. 60% of all synthetic materials derived from um, fossil fuels. And the point is, why don't we just switch to renewables? And because they're a little more expensive, we'll, we'll weather, we'll weather the, the storm. We need only look to Europe in a couple of countries that are more like our country than, uh, than any other countries in the world, Germany and the UK, who about half a dozen years before EPA proposes the Clean Power Plan had enacted laws to do something very, very similar. If you Google energy poverty or electricity as a luxury good, there's all kinds of things. You'll see all kinds of headlines in major German and UK media. One of my favorite is that Germany's green energy revolution is a fatal blunder with ugly consequences. It doesn't work. What's going on in Germany now, and, and the, the, the UK is, is not far behind it, is um, they are actually increasing carbon dioxide. They're going to uh, plans to build 10 new lignite-fired power plants. Why? Because the more renewables they put on the grid, they have to back it up 100 percent to avoid fluctuations in transmission or in, um, uh, in dispatching electricity to the, to the grid. One thing e EPA's cruel power plan does that um, uh, was not mentioned, I, I fully agree with everything else I heard, but is that it makes dispatch of electric power to the grid based, the priority is based on the carbon content of the fuel. This replaces um, cost, safety, and reliability. And that's a way why it's really cruel because it jeopardizes the whole system by putting um, um, fuels which are th ultimately are, are, are in, in re require far more um, inputs and therefore higher costs, but it doesn't work. Um, the more renewables Germany and the UK are putting on, the more they have to, to have either coal-fired power plants or um, natural gas-fired power plants in the ready like a car idling. Uh, also because of this, if you look a little closer than their boast about how much renewable they're putting on the electric grid, um, in their energy portfolio in Germany now, 40 percent of that is from wood. Um, and the EU made a, a political decision, not a scientific decision, that um, a wood was, car wood was carbon neutral um, because you can burn a tree and you can plant a tree. But it's amazing what's going on. And the cruel part is um, Google um, um, in energy poverty in Germany, and you get statistics that up to 800,000 homes in Germany no longer are connected to the grid and indeed burn wood for, um, for their heating source. It's amazing that this is not. I think it's really important for our policymakers at the state level and the uh, at the national level to look very clearly at what's going on in Europe. Europe renewables, as far as the extent of demand, demand we depend upon in prosperous countries, renewables don't make. Um, and if, uh, there are, if you look at the engineers rather than the climate scientists, um, it's really, really eye-opening. If this rule survives judicial scrutiny, it will have changed our form of government for many of the reasons everyone shared here. It is, you know, non-elected um, employees of the federal government have, have come up with this. Um, policies with this kind of consequence must be a decision of those um, who represent us that we vote for, in, or we will have changed our form of government. And I'm just going to close with another kind of big sweeping thing. What else, what other major issue is happening as, as we now have federal mandates to reduce um, consumption of energy. Um, we have uh, an, a revolution in, in oil and gas production from shale that has the potential to not only change our country but the world. We have access now to a vast quantity, and the whole world does, uh, but we have access to an um, enormous store of oil and gas in, in, that, in, in shale which could transform, it, had, it had, did transform the Texas economy, and it certainly put our nations and, and, the, and the world. There's something like um, $120 billion in the last three years it's been invested in the uh, um, construction of new petrochemical plants. 
or expansions of current rooms, all kinds of positive consequences. And it's happening at a time where we have learned and succeeded um, in, in operating upstream oil and gas production, refinery, uh, refining, you name the industry. We can do so with enormous environmental sensitive sensitivity to real pollutants. Carbon, carbon dioxide is not one of those. Um, and so I will just um, close in saying it's really important to step back sometimes beyond the, all the complexities of these rules and what they would do um, and see the grand sweep of this. This is, um, I didn't reach this conclusion easy, easily. I'm not a, uh, always imagining there's a, a black helicopter from the United Nations um, circling around, but this is about power. This is about power. As this rule itself, which is a kind of federalizing of our electric system, and, and as all that's going on in the negotiations about the climate uh, treaty in Paris, um, it all assumes a much more powerful feder central, federal, or global government. It's really, um, people have been discussing this for 30 years, but something is different. It's being institutionalized in laws and rules and international agreements, which um, leads me to my uh, second conclusion, I guess. Um, it means a loss of all kinds of personal freedoms we have and the dynamics of freedom um, in competitive markets. Um, and this is really a historic crossroads. Uh, but I think all we need is um, enlightened national leadership, you might say, because um, the facts are on our side. And we have no need to get into climate science today. But the facts in climate science um, are on our side. And it's time to. Um, just say no, I believe, and I hope that's what our, our state will do and many other states will do um, in any effort to comply with this um, very, very damaging rule. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Kathleen, and thank you, panelists, for some provocative uh, presentations. Now it's time for audience questions and answers. Uh, think about your question. And uh, as you're thinking about how to formulate your question, uh, I'd like to emphasize that please make it a question. Sometimes we, we hear very long soliloquies from the audience, and we really need to hear from our panelists. So formulate your question. And we have people uh, with a microphone, I believe, uh, yes. Uh, and so if you wish to ask a question, uh, please raise your hand. And uh, what we'd like to hear from you before you formulate your question is, who are you? Right? And if you're from an organization, let us know uh, what, what organization you're from. And then if you have a question to a specific panelist, uh, let us know who that panelist is. And let's uh, go to Q&A. And I think we may have a question over here. Uh, hi, my name is Jeremy Mazur. I work for Senator Van Taylor. My question for the panel is, it's for all of you. Let's say we come back 10 years from now. The, the clean power plan rule has gone into effect. The judges have upheld it. When you come back to this panel 10 years from now, what's going to be your key point in talking about this Clean Power Plan to communications? What would be the benefits or the flaws to the plan that you would foresee 10 years from now? That's a very provocative question. And I have to say, for the audience, that's the standard to which you should aspire. So please. <laughs> I like this. Mine's really quick. Uh, and I forgot to mention steel shoes. In Germany, the retail electric rates are three times higher, not 30%, not 70%. They thought they were earlier. I'm, I think that, that um, it, it will be a, situ a situation where electric rates have gone up like three or four times, which is something that affects every family, every business, uh, every hospital, every school. Because that's, what, uh, that's what's happening in there. Costs are far higher than anybody envisioned. All right, I'll, I'll say let's hope that 10 years from now we aren't here talking about um, what, uh, what has transpired by virtue of those rules going into effect. But I guess basically most of us would stand here and say, I told you so. I mean, <laughs> look, look at probably what we are estimating is very conservative in comparison to what the impact could be. Uh, yes, Jeremy, I had a great question. Uh, uh, I would hope also that 10 years from now we still could be discussing the Stop Act 2015. Uh, the, uh, the other thing that uh, Kathleen White touched on is that coal and the other advantages coal has keeping a standard of uh, availability of electricity uh, with this plan it has nothing it does nothing about all the other regulatory 
problem is that the electricity that you're dealing with, like the original Hays program, the coal ash program, the MAC, which is the mercury and ash, right? They're toxic. The cross-state air pollution, all these other federal government regulations that this industry is trying to deal with, on top of this, this is not in a vacuum, but this is another big crucial issue. And so all those things can affect the coal industry. The coal industry is critical in ramping, that is, so that, as a matter of fact, if some of these coal plants, because of these things, they're dealing with these other issues, and they have to make a decision, are they going to add on another black box, or are they going to put more money into trying to take care of their Hays program, for instance? It may just very well just shut down and say, well, just, hey, you know, we're out of the game. We just can't afford it. When that happens and the amount of electricity from, from coal generation diminishes, it actually can diminish the implementation of renewable energies that require, Council talked about, uh, that require a constant coal baseline, if you would, to be able to integrate these other uh, energy forms because they don't come at the time that, uh, that we actually need them Thank you. to ramp up our energy needs. Thank you. I guess I would say in the, the hypothetical that you posited, my questions would be, one, how are you enjoying having the electricity reliability of a third world country? Uh, <laughs> two, how many of you that can afford it have invested in a personal backup generator? Uh, and I bet it would go, I bet if I asked that question today, it would be less than 10%. I bet then it would be 80% or more. Uh, and three, to, to quote Dr. Phil of all people, uh, how's it working out for you calling <laughs> EPA and the National Resources Defense Council when your lights go out? So just to uh, further add to uh, uh, the simulation, I know we have Olivia back here uh, on the sound and light board. Olivia, bring the lights down just for a moment. We'll do a simulation of a decade from now. All right, here we go, here we go, see, see? Okay, now you can bring them back up again, so. And of course, what you don't see is behind the door there, there's an intern on a bike generator keeping, <laughs> keeping this going, so. Um, all right, another question, please, to Roger Borgelt, who I know will ask a wonderful question. Okay, uh, Roger Borgelt, I'm a practicing attorney in the regulatory arena, and I guess my question would be, is this the rule, is this the case that I'm assuming this is ultimately going to end up at our U.S. Supreme Court ultimately, where we finally get rid of this legal doctrine of deference to the reasonableness of whatever any regulatory agency does. I mean, we do we revisit Chevron with this case? Is this the one? Uh, I'll take that. Well, I, I would say, I would have to say, I, I don't think that, that Chevron uh, will completely go away with this case. I, I think it will certainly be revisited again and as some of you may know, in the last uh, Obamacare case, uh, what uh, Chief Justice Roberts said, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but essentially, we are not going to apply Chevron deference in this case because this issue is, is too important. So I would say at least on that level, and I guess the, I should say also the gloss on that was if we were to overrule Obamacare uh, in this case, it would fundamentally remake national policy and were Congress to give that authority to an agency, the IRS is an unlikely agency for it to choose. I, I think it could also be said here, this, is, this rule will fundamentally reshape uh, the way that electricity is generated and transmitted and if Congress were to give that power to a federal executive agency, the EPA is an awfully unlikely agency to choose to do that. Mark, could you pl please just spend uh, 30 uh, seconds to a minute explaining for the uninitiated what Chevron is? Sure, the, the, the Chevron doctrine com comes from a case that in involved Chevron. And, and in a nutshell, it says that where there are multiple ch policy choices to be made, 
or where there is some ambiguity in a statute defining the agency's mission and the discretion that it has to make policy choices, the courts are supposed to defer to the agency's expertise in exercising that discretion. And, and I think that I, I understand um, the reasons for that rule because there, there is certainly a, a time and a place to say that courts should not continually get bogged down in second guessing agencies created for a particular purpose. But unfortunately what's happened is it's become a great way for courts to fail to address important issues. To simply say this issue is really complicated I don't understand it very well, so I'll just go with the agency. It's kind of like the progressive ideal of uh, government by uh, technocrats through the administrative state, right? Absolutely, and Chuck, just to comment uh, sure. on you, the other difficulty with that is that one, it allows the agencies to interpret their own rules, so they're kind of self-feeding, kind of envisioning there, but these agencies, unfortunately, have the power of enforcement. Right. And so, I mean, so they wouldn't take it down that Kathleen? But um, in, in, in response to both, those two comments, um, the Clean Air Act, we are right of way for all of the new proposed water measures that the Clean Air Act puts in the Clean Water Act itself. In, in the language of the act, Congress delegates a huge authority that are issued in the law right of way. And I think in the kind of decision and, and the magnitude of the consequences of those decisions, that's the root of the problem. Under the cur under the current framework, I mean, I think that, that I think that you can you can articulate the uh, new statute to limit these so that uh, so they're not so I mean, 40 years ago when the act was enacted, it wasn't as so it's kind of a nice situation. The Bonner was going to be very enthusiastic about clean air. It's off the scale of Bristol, um, and um, then they can blame the agency when the agency. Unfortunately, I don't know when it's really Congress delegates so much law and authority to the agency. I mean, it's, it's a vicious circle that ultimately must be, um, if it's changed at all, must be enforced by, by the courts. Another question, please, from the audience. Yes, in the back, over here. Thank you. Will McAdams with Toy Frazier's office. For the panel, is there a danger uh, or, or what should – the, pol the policy strategy, uh, what policy strategy should the state pursue, um, especially over the next two years before the next session that would not endanger the legal strategy that the industry coalition and the state are pursuing in tandem? That is an awesome question because it really goes to the heart of, and, and frankly there's a lot of controversy about exactly what you said across the country, right? You see different states uh, pursuing different paths. I think some of them uh, cluelessly and others perhaps uh, deliberately, but th there seems like there's a, a multiple uh, paths that you can take. Uh, Kathleen, I know that you've looked at that issue uh, and perhaps mm -hmm. Doc and, and uh, Mark as well. And I, while I'm not the district judge most familiar with the legal strategy for this, I don't think it, I think the state should be trying to take some kind of ineffective in policy here. And when states do that, and I can understand all the reasons why they they are enabling <laughs> this extra constitutional um, uh, rule. And it was a, a, a Louis McLaughlin stated in a, a, a couple of Obamacare decisions something about keeping the state, state authority from the federal authority. And, and the, the majority says it's the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution envisioned that states would protect that authority by resisting what was overreach, not by accommodating it. And if the state just allocates the money and says, well, you know, federal preemption and pragmatic necessity, one side do the right thing, um, they enable this, this really change in the form of our government. And as you quoted, the question closes where you said the state wants to protect its, its sovereign authority, it has to act like a state. Absolutely, and I agree with you 100 percent, and that's what Texas needs to do. Uh, and uh, to quote uh, Vladimir Putin, yet 
But uh, but actually, with uh, the multiple states have had different responses. Generally, it's uh, trying to uh, restrict their agencies from overacting. In other words, agencies ask to come back for legislative approval before they go forward with the, the state plan. But uh, some of them uh, want to stop it altogether. Some of them uh, uh, want to take some kind of uh, legislative. Uh, but whatever the case, the legislature definitely needs to be involved, and Texas will definitely need to be involved. And we'll see what that form up with our constituents. I guess I would say, and I, I don't disagree with anything that, that um, my distinguished colleagues on the panel have said. I, I, and I don't think anybody, I don't think you're going to find anybody that would recommend uh, that Texas simply capitulate um, and, and comply with the rule. I, I do think that there, there is a case to be made uh, for to at least considering the option that Texas propose and other states propose a, a, I don't know what the right word I'm looking for is, but, but I think everybody agrees that EPA has the power to do certain things that are talked about under the rule. And I, I do think that there's room in the discussion. And full disclosure, I represent power plants uh, and, and electrical producers. But, it, but I think there is a concern there that there may be at least part of that discussion to say that it makes some sense um, um, in, in a spirit of, of trying to work together and compromise and, and recognizing different points of view to at least be willing to do the things that we think are lawful, even though that would never come close to providing with the plan. And I won't try to make that case today, but I do hope that going forward that that's at least part of the discussion. I might just add, I think that if states start to comply, then they're basically um, uh, taking the position that the EPA has the right to do this and that this will, uh, that the challenges will not stand up in court. And I think we need to wait until this is fully litigated before we make any decision to try to comply. Well, I think some states uh, have taken that position. That is, let's wait until all this legal plays out before we entertain it. Uh, just as, uh, to mention uh, uh, to Mark, I appreciate his position there. Uh, we passed a, uh, as far as the state uh, uh, protection and availability charter, and uh, reliability charter in um, Los Angeles with ALEC, which is a conservative group of the legislature. One pushback that we had was from the, from the uh, utility industry, uh, and uh, they wanted to kind of go forward somewhat with that, but the, the one thing that we know that we were able to prevail is that the utility industry could say, along there and do have increased costs, uh, they, they're very, you know, they want to make sure that they have a reliable source of uh, electricity, but the cost is not as much a factor as it is for Joe Sixpack to do it or elderly folks on fixed incomes when they have to deal with that increase in cost. Well, and to uh, Representative Anderson's point, um, it's also, uh, it also impacts manufacturing uh, as well. and. Uh, uh, it's important to note that in many states, the uh, publicly regulated utilities are uh, under far more of a regulatory burden than they are necessarily in Texas, where you have a bit of a, of a free market in electrical. Uh, and in most states, you have a guaranteed rate of return. So if the costs go up, the utilities are going to do just fine. Uh, people still have to buy electricity. There might be a, a reduction in, um, in usage. But at the end of the day, they have a guaranteed rate of return because they're publicly regulated utilities. So uh, that's uh, an interesting point that we ought not to forget uh, that in some cases you have industries that are so heavily regulated they're kind of used to uh, working with the regulators. Uh, another question, yes sir. Hi, I'm Mark Ferrar. I've been an activist here in Austin regarding residential rates. And um, my question was the, the um, projections that ERCOT is making about what the impact would be on our residential rates seem really, really mild to me. And what assumptions are they making even about having that base power available? Because even prior to this rule being considered, they were under a lot of pressure to start considering these central planning kinds of approaches to making sure we had enough capacity for our grid. What's going to make people come to the table with capacity when, when the uh, electric is going to be uh, dispatched based on your carbon rating rather than 
the uh, the efficiency of this, this plant that you built and put online. Let me, let me say just one second here, if I can just kind of read a little bit here. This is from ERCOT's preliminary study, uh, and the, uh, which I very much respect, I support the whole organization. Uh, but they're talking about a 20% projected increase by 2020 without accounting for associated cost of transmission upgrades, remember Trez, $6.9 billion. Natural gas supply, what would be the cost when the nationwide they're trying to force more natural gas uh, utilization. Uh, infrastructure upgrades, procurement of additional ancillary services, energy efficient investments, capital cost of new capacity, uh, and other costs associated with retirement decrease or decreased operation of coal fired power plants. So, so it's 20 percent, but not including that long list that you just. <laughs> 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 I think your point has just been made. I'd Kathleen? just like to add again for the lessons from Europe. What happened um, more acutely in Germany, but also in the UK, is that it became uneconomic for the coal and natural gas plants to operate. So they, not all, but some of them closed down. Both countries are now subsidizing. Uh, coal or na and natural gas, and there are very different natural gas setups, particularly Germany that pays a very dear price importing it from Russia. Um, but they've had to uh, sub subsidize everything, subsidize the, the plants to come back online for backup. And they claim that now that it, they, they didn't really need, they call it 100% redundancy. Think about what that means. <coughs> if, if there's a demand, uh, you know, the grid, electric grid is, is a a marvel and an amazingly complex thing. Electricity is generated almost instantaneously with demand. You know, there's no, there's no, there's no lag time. Um, but, but what it has meant is they're paying twice for the same amount of energy to the grid. And I just imagine how that increased cost flows through the whole system. Um, and is ultimately, I hate to use the overused phrase, non-sustainable. <laughs> a point too that we might mention in saying this. The F3DC, the basic fuel threat behind the uh, beltway curtain, uh, they're actually talking about natural gas is a fossil fuel. And so we need to start regulating natural gas. And so as I say, folks come out and they want to take a reasonable approach and try and uh, deal with this issue. But the shifting paradigm, and if you look at Obamacare, what they were doing, rewriting the rules as they go along, rewriting the laws as they go along, and they could very well, and some people are talking about, okay, we need to start restricting natural gas because it's a fossil fuel. And then they're also talking about methane. Now are they going to regulate methane? So what we're looking at today, or what the final plan may, proposal may be, is going to be a shifting paradigm as we go forward. So I mean, that's definitely something we need to keep in mind as we deal with this. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, appointed time is nigh, and our panel is coming to a close. I would please uh, invite all of you to recognize our wonderful panel. Now, before you get up and leave, I am required to burden you with an advertisement. We have three upcoming events uh, that I'm sure that you'll be very interested in. These are all here at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. So very briefly, you may want to get out your, your personal uh, uh, devices, though, because I'm sure you're going to want to put these on your calendar. Uh, first, we have a policy primer, the debate over Texas state-supported living centers how to Reform an Outdated System. That's on October 6th here at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. We'll be discussing ways to reform this ineffective system of care for those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, our next policy primer after that is entitled Spotlight, Transparency and Accountability in State Agencies. That's on October 19th, again here at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, where we will be reviewing and critiquing Texas's state agencies for their transparency and accountability or lack thereof. Uh, lastly, uh, returning to the theme of energy, we have at the Crossroads Energy and Climate Policy Summit, November uh, 19th and 20th, again here at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. This, by the way, is our second annual uh, Energy and Climate Policy Summit. We'll be gathering the world's foremost experts uh, brought together to analyze the historic energy revolution. And that is a two-day event, again, uh, in November on the 19th and 20th. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for attending today. Have a wonderful rest of your day.